you here have ever worked in a group project where one person did all the work and another person did absolutely none of it? Yeah, yeah, I see some of you guys not raising your hands. Um, I want to know what's going on there. But. <laughs> so, so why is group learning so unproductive? Well, in group learning, we might be working with people we have no sort of connection to or no sort of, sort of interest in knowing. For example, we might ask one person to do the first two slides of the slideshow, another person to do the next two, but the first person doesn't do their slides, and the second person does absolutely all of them. We all know how it goes. So group learning rarely works, which is why so many people, students, teachers, even business professionals are scared of it. However, it has the potential to work with something called collaborative learning. Oh. So collaborative learning takes into account people's specific skill sets, strengths, and weaknesses in creating more productive learning. So today, I will talk to you about my experiences in two different learning environments with an emphasis on individualistic versus collaborative learning and how an increase in collaborative learning will cause things that high schoolers struggle with right now to become obsolete in the future. So in the late spring of my eighth grade year, I applied to a brand new school called the Academy of Engineering and Technology. And I didn't know anything about it, applied completely on a whim with no expectations. And if you know anything about the STEM schools here in Lowning County, you know how rare this is. I mean, the students and their parents, actually mostly just their parents, train them specifically from middle school to get into these high schools, right? And so, if you're not from one of the richest counties in the, United, in the United States, this might seem a little weird to you that middle schoolers work so hard in middle school just to have the opportunity to learn somewhere different in high school. But that's how it works here. And so, I'm not the smartest person ever, but I work really hard. So I applied to a brand new program called Entrepreneurship where they stress something called project-based and collaborative learning. So in my entrepreneurship program, I experienced the highlight of collaborative learning in a program called Incubator EDU. So my freshman year in entrepreneurship, I had learned all the ideal things you need to start a business, things like marketing tactics, financial plans, even other business tactics. In my sophomore year, we were able to actually apply this into something tangible, like a business. So I remember at the beginning of the class, sophomore year, we had to take a survey. And so I've been with these people since the beginning of my freshman year, and I was so annoyed that we had to take this survey. Like, just place us in our groups already. We, know, we all know who each other are. But we took this survey, and this ended up being one of the best things that ever happened to me in high school. So let me tell you why. In this survey, we picked what we were passionate about in business, what we felt like our strengths were, and what we best felt like we could contribute to the group. And this separated us into four different categories. The first category, or my category, was the visionaries. Then there was the rainmakers, responsible for the financials, the customer service, and the product service people. So each, each category, one of each of us was placed into each group, and each category came with unique expectations, deadlines, and what they were supposed to contribute to the group. So in a rough poll I've done at my school, I found out that most people prefer days at AET more than they prefer days at their home school, since we go every other day to our STEM schools. And I wonder why. I mean, you obviously come here to challenge yourself. It's harder. It's more stressful. The answer is the reason for collaboration and the reason for passion. So also at my school, we have something called innovation challenges where it combines the entire school, all three pathways, IT, engineering, and entrepreneurship, and we're all put together and told to make something. So we get rough deadline, rough material set, very, very rough instructions. For example, once we built a coin sorter out of just cardboard, wood, and tape. So this helps people who are less comfortable in the group setting become more comfortable in the process. And so I'd like to think of the common group project in the exact same way. So in innovation challenges, you're given this set of materials. And same with group projects, you're given a set of skill sets of the people you work with. So in these innovation challenges, we use every single material we have at our disposal to our advantage. And it would be a shame not to do the same thing in a group project. And so using everyone's skills in a collaborative group makes groups more effective. 
So, it turns out that the 80s not only created some of the best music of the century, but also created some of the best research on collaborative versus individualistic learning. So in 1989, Johnson's and Johnson's did research on why collaborative learning is more effective than individualistic, and they found out it was because of three key reasons. The first reason is that it creates higher achievability, so people can actually accomplish more under these group settings, collaborative group settings, than they normally would be able to. The second one is that it creates more caring and supportive relationships with the people you work with which I think is the most important in the business world where people feel like they have no connection to the people they work with. And the third and final reason, which is the most important for teenagers our age, is that it actually increases our psychological, mental health, and self-esteem. While this research has stood the test of time, there's also been some unique effects, only a few are up there. Um, it increases things like language apprehension, literacy levels. It's effective in STEM communities where I actually thrive. So if collaborative research is so effective, then why isn't it being used more often? Well, the reason is that maybe it's laziness or maybe it's the fact that it's hard to implement, but so many people are used to being judged, especially teenagers, on how they do with a pencil and paper test. And so that brings me to my next point. An increase in collaborative learning will cause things like standardized testing to become obsolete in the future. Now, before everyone goes crazy, I know we all have to take standardized testing. Let me explain. So over a thousand colleges are currently test optional, meaning that they do not require you to send in your SAT or ACT score in order to be admitted into their school. This includes many of the big names like Harvard and University of Chicago. And the reason I wanted to make this talk in the first place is because I actually read a study from the National Association for College Counseling where over 120,000 people were part of the study to see if submitting higher SAT or ACT scores has any effect on how you do in college or even after college. And I think you already know what I'm gonna say is that there was no impact. It showed that SAT scores cannot be uh, a specific measure of intellect or success. That there are different types of intelligences that need to be measured other than the intelligences that standardized testing are measuring. So, my story, I am diagnosed with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, better known as POTS. So basically, the blood pools in my legs, I get dizzy and I pass out at the most inconvenient times in the most inconvenient places. For example, and you can laugh at these because I laugh at these, I passed out at the top of the Empire State Building in the middle of a street, <laughs> and most recently, during my AP calculus exam, which is just really unfortunate, <laughs> But um, I personally cannot sit and take a standardized test for three plus hours. But what about people with problems that are worse than mine? People with problems like ADHD, dyslexia, or even autism. So the problem with this, people are given accommodations. Accommodations exist for some, but the root of the problem is that we are all placed on this platform expected to do the exact same thing and get the exact same score. So, how do we fix this and move towards a more collaborative mindset? Well, in my experience in creating a business, in research, science research on the regional and state level, and even starting clubs that I'm passionate about at my school, all of which, by the way, I could not have done just by myself, I have found that there are five key ways to increase collaborative learning mindset. The first way is the most important because without it, we can't have anything else and that's to create a relaxed environment. To create an environment where it's okay to brainstorm, to have crazy ideas. If people have these crazy ideas, they're more likely to be successful than those who bring no ideas to the table. The second one is to identify the strengths of each group member, and I know what you're all thinking. I've worked in a group with someone who has absolutely no strengths at all. <laughs> I tell you that that might be a little bit true. Um, <laughs> But the strengths might not be as glaringly there as some others, but everyone has something that they're passionate about, that they're willing to learn more about and contribute to the group. This makes every group member feel needed and creates a more productive process. The third one is to embrace failure. I know this entire event today has been about failure. But I tell you, you know, innovators who have had successes in the past, 
They say that they had failure over and over and again before they get to these successes. But this failure cannot just be embraced on an individual level. It has to, has to be embraced by the group itself. The group itself has to be on board with the failure. The fourth reason is to be honest with your team. In my groups that I've worked with, we implemented positive and negative feedback from the start. So if everyone knows what they're doing right, most importantly, but also the little things that they can work on, they're able to um, express themselves in a more positive way. And the fifth and final one is to set goals. Uh, we just talked about this, and this is really important, but not just huge, big goals that might be a little lofty, like, oh, I'm going to make a million dollars in my business next year. You have to set small, achievable goals that we can work towards every single day. If we achieve these goals, smaller goals, we'll be more likely to be able to work towards the bigger goals. So I feel super lucky. I'm lucky to be a part of a generation that works together towards one common goal. But I think teachers, school systems, and uh, students themselves have the power to create the change of education. So I see a future of education of revolutionizing the way we work together. Change sparks progress, and progress sparks innovation. Thank you.